All right, folks. Okay. Take a seat and come on in. We're going to have a little uh, time contemplating um, the significance of the Bible. But I'm going to pray first, so let's, let's just do that. God, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that you're doing things already in us. And it's all because you're good and you love us and you want to do good things. So I praise you for that. We ask that this time um, of focusing on your word, that we would be open, that we would be ready to receive what it is that you want to say. Give us hearts that are, are ready to respond. Ears that are open to hear. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak. We know that this is not just a thing of learning more information, but we need you, Holy Spirit, to move in us. So we give you this time, God. Amen. As Denny said, we're talking about a devoted life over the next number of weeks. And she showed you um, the different different things that we'll be looking at. But I want to ask you a question first of all before we start. I want to ask you, what makes something valuable? It's rare. So something being rare makes it valuable, yeah. High demand. High demand. It's good. The worth you put to it. The, worth you put to it. the way it makes you feel. The way it makes you feel. That's good. All good answers. The next question is, is value always subjective? So by that I mean, is it just you that makes something valuable? Like you might think, I I love this, this is valuable to me. Is it just a subjective thing? Or is there something that's valuable objectively, aside from you, aside from what you think and what you feel? Can something have value objectively? Yeah, oxygen. That's a great. That's a great one. Oxygen is pretty valuable, and it has nothing to do with what you think about it. You might have a a bad opinion about oxygen, perhaps, but you need it. What would indicate that you value something? Take care of it. Time you spend with it. Telling people about it. How well you look after it. Your attitude. Great. Well, we are talking about Bible meditation. Now, honestly, I I feel like I could talk for a whole term about the value of the Bible. And we could look at all sorts of reasons why it's worth valuing. But um, it's not the only thing that we're going to be looking at over this term. So I have to condense everything into one, (laughs) which, yeah, oh well. Um, I hope that at the end of this, there will be at least a little further progression in your heart towards valuing the Bible. And I recognize that there's all, like, there's quite the range of where people might be at in terms of how you view the Bible or your experience with the Bible. Um, And so wherever you're at, whether you've been reading it and studying it and meditating on it for 50 years or whether you're only just now starting to have a look and peer into it, 
I hope that you take one step further in valuing it and letting that value express itself in your engagement with it. So just a couple of quick facts. Some of you would know these, some of you wouldn't. How many books, you know, the Bible, where did I put my Bible? Oh, there's this one. I've got a few Bibles here. This is not just one book, is it? It's a collection of books. How many books are in this? 66. That's right. Um, Unless you're Catholic. There's some more. In terms of... There's, there's reasons why there's 66 books and why we don't go with the Catholic Bible. There's extra ones. That it's called the Apocrypha. There's reasons why we don't f- um, include the works of the Apocrypha or um, other books because there were lots of things written in that first century and in the second century. And, and so lots of things were floating around um, and some of them... Oh, I'm talking about the New Testament particularly here. The Old Testament, it was already settled what books were in the Old Testament. By the time Jesus came, it was already settled. And there was 39 um, uh, books that were set apart as the canon of the Old Testament. And Jesus accepted that. He talked about the scriptures. That was that. There were other books that were written. So Malachi was at the the end of the, the Old Testament Then there was 400 years about between there and when Jesus came along. There were some things written in that time. In, I got you to say that funny word, the intertestamental period. Um, In that intertestamental period, there were things written. Some of those things are included in the Catholic Bible. Um, But the Jewish people didn't, they said they're, they're good books, they're valuable books, but they're not part of the canon of Scripture. There was an understanding, a separation of things that they felt were, they knew were inspired by God and then just other good writings. And so the 39 books of the Old Testament were already settled by the time Jesus came. The 27 of the New Testament were amongst these other writings that were going around and eventually the church came to a place of saying, we have to define which ones are really um, uh, reliable and so it had to be related to either either an apostle wrote it or it was a direct um, um, passing on from an apostle and so you have these 27 books now then later on and people you know in the I think it was the time of the Da Vinci Code did anyone read that or watch that the Da, da Vinci Code um, it At that time, what was his name? Was it Dan Brown, I think, who wrote that, was saying that there were these other Gospels that aren't included and it was this whole big idea that there was a conspiracy of, you know, what was included in the Bible and what was left out. And it was all, to be honest, it was, you know when you get a little bit of information, it becomes dangerous? So he learnt that there were other books that were written, so like the Gospel of Thomas, they they call it. And so it's like, (gasps) oh... The church must have been tricking us all along and got this little bit of information and totally misused it. Um, the Gospel of Thomas was not a reliable... It, it, let me tell you one thing that he says at the end of the Gospel of Thomas, and this will be enough to convince you that it's... He said... Um, Jesus spent time with Mary Magdalene so that she could become a man because women don't have souls. And so if a woman wants to have a soul, he must be, she must become a man. So that's the Gospel of Thomas. So clearly out of line with what the Scriptures say. The value of women. Jesus actually valued women And he lifted them up further than anyone ever had before and acknowledged um, the value of of women. And it was was shocking to the age. And and Paul did the same. It was shocking the way that he valued women. You, You look at Greek 
philosophy and some of the things that Plato said about women as well. And it's terrible. And Paul made some really awesome statements to really counter those terrible teachings. So, there were certain books that then the church said this was definitely, we know that this was written by Paul, this was written by Matthew, this was written by Peter, and so these were the 27 that were included. You can delve right into learning more about how they put it all together, and it's, it's worth looking at, but I know from what I've read and what I understand, it is reliable that these 66 that we have are the ones that God chose to be continued throughout the centuries for us to read and understand who he is and his plan for us. There were over 40 authors who put this together. It was written, like the different books, there's three languages. You've got um, Hebrew, you've got Aramaic, and you've got Greek. They were written on three continents, these books at different times, and it was written over 1,500 years. There's no, there's no collection of books like this that then becomes one consistent story with 40-plus authors, 66 books, three continents, three languages, over 1,500 years, and yet there's this constant flow of a story the unfolding of God's plan for the world and the coming of the Messiah. And um, it's just absolutely incredible how this book comes together. There's no other book like it. No other religion has a book like this. It is unique um, and amazing. It is now the most translated book of all time and it is the highest selling book of all time. Every year, it gets the highest selling book of the year. And so they stop, you know, saying that this one is the highest because it's like, oh, yeah, wins again, wins again, wins again. We'll just talk about the other ones. But every year, it is the highest selling book. It's amazing. There's no book like it. There's a couple of scriptures that I want to just, just uh, kind of bring out this scripture from timothy he says all scripture this is paul speaking he says all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of god may be thoroughly equipped for every good work one of the most significant words in that passage there that scripture there well, the thing that stands out to me, apart from God breathed, obviously God breathed means that it's, other translations might say God inspired, but there's this concept of the breath of God. But the thing I like about this is that is the word is. It doesn't say all scripture was God breathed. It brings it right into the present that the word of God is the breath of God. Like now, it's not just something of the past. It's something now of God speaking now. His breath speaks. His breath, his breath is breathed in the word of God now. There's something so powerful and sacred about these scriptures. There are some people who, who still talk about the, say that the only inspired English version is the King James Version, which um, I'll just say it's an unfortunate um, idea that people have because it's not true. Jesus didn't speak English and he didn't speak Old English. Um, the interesting thing, I read something from C.S. Lewis. He was writing a forward to um, the, I think it's the Phillips Bible. So back in the, in the 50s, I think it was, there was a translation that was going into newer English and this was a really 
um, odd idea at that time. People had been reading the King James Version, English people had been reading the King James Version for a long time. And this new modern translation was coming in and people were appalled at the idea. And C.S. Lewis in his, in his writing The Ford made a really good um, point that um, if you're alarmed at the, the, the commonness of a fresh translation, then you, you need to be alarmed at the whole Bible because particularly the Greek was written in common language. It wasn't some uh, really lofty language that it was spoken in. It was spoken in the common language for the common person. So it only makes sense to translate it into a common vernacular so that people can read it and understand it. It's for the common person. Um, I don't, I'm not saying that I'm against the King James. It's, it definitely served its purpose and it was amazing. I just I don't think it's the best translation for now. In terms of people understanding it, not only that, there were also earlier manuscripts found since the writing of the, the King James Version. And translators now go back to the earliest manuscripts they can get in order to translate and get the best possible translation. So um, there are some things that the King James says that like, for example, money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. Newer versions show that it says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Um, you know, that's just one example of... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're going to get into is good, as long as you can understand it. That's the point. Don't, don't be reading something that's too far above you. In Like, even language structure has kind of changed from King James times to now and you need to be able to read something that you understand and that you can engage with and go, oh, I get it. If King James is for you, great, get into it. Um, but if it's a bit above you, then find something else. In terms of all scripture is God breathed, there's also this scripture from Hebrews that says, for the word of God is alive and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. There's a living vibrancy in the Word of God when you engage with it. Um, it's amazing. I love this, this psalm. Um, psalm 119 is a really long chapter, but it... Um, the writer, it's actually an acrostic um, from the Hebrew alphabet, and each, each stanza uses that letter for the alphabet. It's really, really cool. Um, but in this scripture here, it says, The law from your mouth. So that's, you know, at the time of the writing of this, the scriptures at that time, they didn't have the scriptures that we have. It was only a part of it, because that's all that had been written at that time. And as the person is writing this, they probably didn't realize that this was going to become part of Scripture you know, as they're writing it. But they were feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit with it to write it. And so they wrote this. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. And throughout that psalm, he's talking about his longing to understand and to take it in, to meditate on it, and to know it, meditating on it day and night, he talks about. Joshua, um, also, he, he had you know, walked with Moses, and Moses wrote those first five books of the Bible. And so that's called the, the books of the law. And so Joshua is told by God, keep this book of the law, Always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. I, th I think about the people who wrote this and um, particularly in the New Testament, every single one of the writers 
was severely persecuted. And they wrote these things for, uh, it wasn't written to us, it was written to particular people at a particular time. But God's intention that it was written for us through incredible cost. And throughout the centuries, it has had such a big, um, I guess, the, the cost of you being able to get this has been very, very high. Um, in the 1200s, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was, John Wycliffe was a priest, a Catholic priest, and this is before the Protestant Reformation, which is in the 1500s. And they call him the morning star the, of the Reformation because he wanted to translate the Bible into the common language, English. He was an English guy. And people were really angry at him. The church was very angry at him for him wanting to do that. He also believed that some of the things that were being taught in the Catholic Church were not in line with Scripture. So he started preaching against some of the practices that were going on in the church. He ended up getting burnt at the stake. But he translated the Bible and he had a team that translated the Bible into English and it was being smuggled around for people to be able to read and get a hold of. And so now we, we still have, there's an organisation called the Wycliffe um, Bible Translators and they're still doing the work of translating into people's languages in places that have never been able to read the Word of God in their own language. And so they're still at work at that. And people are still risking their lives now to get Bibles into places where it's illegal. And the, um, some of the stories are just um, so moving to hear of people's dedication to getting a Bible into someone's hands who have never been able to hold one. I, one story that's stuck with me for 20-something years was at, at this point they couldn't get a group in North Korea couldn't get um, a Bible. And so there was a, um, a young lady who memorized two of the books of the Bible and she became their living Bible. And they would travel hours to meet at 2 a.m. in a cave. And then she would recite those two books of the Bible. It was, it was James and Ephesians. And they would listen to the word and they would take it in together. They'd encourage one another, one another in it, and they would depart before light so that they weren't seen because they knew what would happen if they were caught. And there's so many nations in the world even today People are risking their lives to get this into people's hands. And I guess this, the, the sad thing about being in a country like we're in is that we can be so comfortable that we can have a book of the Bible, uh, sorry, a Bible, or four, just sitting on the shelf collecting dust, Every now and then we might brush it off and have a read. But these people are desperate for it. Um, I told you a story that I heard last year. In India, a guy who's illiterate, he, there is a group um, I can't name them. Um, but they are a group who train up people to go and plant churches in, in Southeast Asia. And this one particular guy, he can't, he's illiterate and he, he, he can't read, but his daughter can read, so would read him the word of God and he would memorize it. And then that would be the thing that he goes out and, then, and he's being illiterate. He has planted 37 churches. But his valuing of the word, every day he gets his daughter to read it to him and he just memorizes what he can memorize. And then that's what he uses to go out and teach people about Jesus.
to be practical, um, like I said, I, we could talk about it forever, but we'll, we'll just get on to a practical encouragement on how to meditate on the Word of God. So there is something that we've been talking about for ages based on um, uh, Wayne Cordero, a bloke over in Hawaii who had this idea, um, which is great. He calls it soap. We call it saw, which is um, scripture observation, application, response. And this is just a way to engage with scripture. You may have been doing this before. Um, Robin has made up books. And if you would like one of these books, you can get it. And what she's done is um, she's made just these pages that has the S-O-A-R, a date in there. And you can, there's two different versions. Whose artwork is this one, Robin? Ruth Boots did the artwork on this one. Um, if you would like to get one of those, and then it can just be your... Bible study journal, then um, how much are you selling them for, Robin? What was it? Right. About 10 bucks. But let me just show you an example of how to use it. So you might be reading, we're encouraging you to read Habakkuk and Galatians, and I, my example here is if I was reading through Habakkuk. So... I get to chapter 2 and I read through chapter 2. Some of it is like really confusing. Some of it's like really shocking. And then this one part stands out to me in particular. And it's this one. So I write it down in the space that says scripture. S for scripture. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isn't that a great scripture? Now the next part, observation. That's where you, you think... What's the context of this? What, are, what did I read in the rest of the chapter? Or what do I know about the person writing this or the people that are listening to it? What's some other context that I can put in here? So obviously there's not much space on here, but this is what I wrote. Habakkuk is lamenting the evil that has taken place in his nation because they have deserted God. But he knows that the glory of, the God, uh, glory of God will be seen and known. Then for application, then once you've you've thought about it, you've looked at it, then it's like, well, what, what does this mean for me? And you always look for either a promise that you can hold on to, an example that you can follow, or a command that you are to obey, or a warning that you're to look out for. So there are four things that you should do when you're thinking about application, when you're reading the Word of God. What do I do? So I just wrote this. The world and nation is going to the dogs, but the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth, and I get to and need to be a part of revealing it. Amen. And so then the response then, so with Wayne Cordero, he says soap, and the P is prayer, and we just thought saw sounds nicer. So R is response, but it means the same thing, really. Or you might want to respond in doing an artwork or something, I don't know. So my response, God, help me not to lose heart with the events of the world around, but rather fill me with the joy of your presence and empower me to show your glory to others around me today. So that's an example of using this method of meditating on the word of God. There's all sorts of things that you can do, but the idea is not that you just read it as a, as a chore of like, oh, I've got to do my chapter today, so I'll quickly read through it and then you move on. There's got to be an engagement of the heart and asking the Holy Spirit, I mean, that's what we should be doing every time we engage with the Word, is asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us and then, um, yeah, meditate on it. And then hopefully through the day, you can keep thinking about it. Let it go around, ponder, let it, you know, chew on it, marinate on it for the whole day. It's good. Just, I'll just share another two scriptures here. This is not for new people, particularly, um, but more for people who have been Christians for a long time. And I... I do this, I bring the scripture up carefully. I don't, I don't want to do it in the, in 
the wrong spirit in any way. But the writer of Hebrews was talking to a bunch of people who had known Jesus for a while. And he says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. You know, there's a scripture where Jesus said, where much has been given, much will be required. And if you've been around the word of God for a long time, but you're just not really fully engaging with it or jumping in and going, I want to understand, I want a deeper understanding of you, God. Teach me. And you're not pressing in like some of these other nations where if you get found with one of these, you can go to prison and get tortured. They dive into it. It's like if anyone should be kind of avoidant, wouldn't it be those people? But no, it's not the case. The people who are in most danger are the ones who jump into it deepest. The, psalm, uh, the psalmist who wrote that psalm that we read a little bit before, he said, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. Now, we're talking about living a devoted life. And Jesus said, come follow me. And as we were saying last two weeks ago, oh, thanks, Grace, by the way. I just forgot to say thank you for preaching last week. Um, really appreciate that. As a little ad break. But we do really appreciate that. I heard lots of good reports. Jumping back. Um, when Jesus says, come follow me, he doesn't just mean, you know like me and you know listen to some of the things i say but he's he's literally saying follow engage with me emulate me be a little me and you know the word christian is the same as little christ that's what it means it it's it's a term that's probably used way too much and particularly when um I guess a couple of decades ago, people talked about it being a Christian nation or whatever. Well, I don't think you can have a Christian nation, let's be honest. It's a personal, you're a little Christ. And in understanding that you're a little Christ, that means you are completely dependent on him as your teacher. To learn from him and move in step with him. And so just thinking about that. Jesus, when he's 12, he goes to the, the temple with the parents. The parents head home with the family and then they realize, hang on, where's Jesus? And they ask and everyone, no one knows where he is. Ah, freaking out as you would. You'd freak out, wouldn't you? And so they race back to Jerusalem after three days. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus, from a very early age, engaged with the scriptures. He knew them. He knew them deeply. And so all through his ministry, you, you hear him talk about the scriptures say. He knew the scriptures. And so if we are to be little Christ or followers of Jesus then we are to engage with his word and know it deeply. Engage with it. Let it change us. Let it transform us. Let it shape the way we think. Just two quotes from current preacher people. John Piper. Faith is born and sustained by the word of God. And out of faith grows the flower of joy. But to enjoy him, we must know him. Bill Johnson says, What I think, live and teach must be consistent with the Bible. So I allow what is written to prune my definitions until it will stand the test of God's word itself. When we understand that this is the final authority on truth, we then need to let this prune our thinking. You can't go the other way around. 
and try and prune this to our thinking. God revealed, he said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts as far as the heavens are above the earth. We cannot prune God's word to fit our thinking. So, let your devotion to God show itself in your commitment to meditating on his word. And I want to encourage you to go deeper into the word. And you know, Michelle was saying before during worship about the encouragement to go deeper. It's exactly what I want to encourage you to do as well. Go deeper into the word of God. Learn the word of God. Really understand it. Because God wants to reveal himself to you more and more as you engage with it. Are you someone who should be teaching by now? Engage with the word of God. So I wrote out a prayer. Have a read of it. Think, if, think about whether that's something that you want to pray. And then we'll pray together if you want to. Is that something that you feel you can pray? If it is, let's just stand together and let's pray this together. Because, you know, it's not... Yes, I want this to be a personal thing, but I also want it to be a community thing, that we are engaging with this together, that we are delving into the Word of God more than we ever have before, together. So let's pray. God... Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you that it is alive and active. Thank you for what it reveals about you and your glory. Thank you for what it reveals about me. Please stir in me a deeper love for your word and help me engage with it more than I ever have. I want to know you more and I want to listen to you more. God, I just pray blessing on every person in this room. You know where we're all at in terms of our engagement with your word. I thank you that you have given us your word and that you want us to engage with it. And I pray, God, for blessing on every person that there would be a, an eagerness and an ease in finding the space. Let there be a rising passion in all of us to engage with your word, to learn it so that we know it deep down and we, uh, as a result, know you more. We know that we don't want to engage with it as just learning information. We want it to be the end result of being close to you. We want to be close to you, God. We want to be so close to you. We want to know your thoughts. And we want to keep in step with your word. So we thank you that you are going to do good things in us as we consume the word that you've given us. May you be glorified in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. And um, may you... Feel that encouragement to read the Word of God today. If you don't have a Bible, oh gosh, look at all the things I forgot. This is something that I wrote about tips on reading the Bible. It talks about context and how to engage with the Bible. And I'd love for you to take one, if you like. This one is a bit more detail about soaring. And so if you need the, the reminder of how to do that soar, then please take one of these. I have these books here. How to read the Bible for all it's worth. Depending on how, you, how much you want to get into this. This is a fantastic book. I don't remember how much it is. But come and get one. And how to read the Bible book by book. And then... I don't remember who gave this to me. Does anyone want to own up to that? 
<laughs> that sounds terrible, doesn't it? I mean, this is a this is a beautiful Bible. It's got all the tabs in there for the books of the Bible, and it's a life application. So it has the Word of God, and then it has all of these little extra notes that you can that can really encourage you. Would anyone like that, Jethro? You can have it. It's the real Bible. Yeah. Yay. That's fantastic. Wow. May you be blessed with that, Jethro. That's awesome. All right. Thanks, folks. Have a great week and uh, know that you're very loved. I'll give it to Robin. Yeah. Good job. I thought I'd downloaded these for free. You have to pay for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, there you go. You can have it. <laughs> At least I get two of them. I think I got three.